All right, welcome everyone to this panel on U.S. imperialism and oil politics, the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa. And what this panel tries to do is to look at the crucial role that oil has in the logic of U.S. imperialism in the 21st century. Uh, of course, oil has always been important to imperial politics, at least since World War I, when Lord Curzon uh, remarked that the Allies floated to victory on a sea of oil. Oil has been, you know, integrally tied to security and so forth. But today the situation is kind of crucial because while demand for oil just continues to grow quite exponentially, the actual existence of known res reserves are beginning to shrink. And so the question of who controls oil, uh, who polices oil, both the existing resources as well as new resources, is crucial to the world economy. And so to address that, we have four excellent panelists today, uh, or I should say three, I'm the fourth one, uh, <laughs> in the interest of humility. <laughs> Our uh, first speaker will be Lee Wengraff, who has written and spoken a lot about uh, African politics. And uh, she is also a member of the ISO, the International Socialist Organization. And she has an excellent piece in the ISR on the new scramble for Africa. So Lee's going to kick it off. And then we'll have Sadia on Afghanistan. And I'll introduce her. And then Michael and then myself. Microphone. Oh, can't steal this. Uh, just to kind of, if people can bear with me in advance, I'm getting, I have a pretty bad cold. So hopefully I can make myself heard um, well enough. So, okay, um, just to sort of kick it off with a discussion about Africa, um, people may be more or less familiar with this, but it's sort of, um, it's a key area because Africa, uh, African oil is actually a growing share of world oil production. And the United States and China in particular are engaged in a battle uh, right now to uh, to tighten their grip on control over it. Just like in the Middle East, this new scramble for Africa is not only about profits, but also about control of strategic resources where the U.S. is concerned um, with threats to its hegemony in the region and the defense and the expansion of that hegemony spilling over into outright military intervention, which is justified under the rubric of fighting terrorism. Uh, dependence of the United States and other developed nations on oil from developing nations is rising uh, and fueling competition between them. So what I'd like to do here today is paint a picture of the rising importance of oil in Africa right now and lay out how this scramble for African oil is fueled inter-imperialist rivalries and stoked militarism in the region and finally, the legacy of imperialism um, and the potential for, re for resistance on the continent. So first off, to just to say uh, uh, quickly about why African oil is important, um, U.S. oil imports from Africa surpassed those from the Middle East for the first time in 2006. And West Africa alone sits, um, on, top of, uh, sits on top of 15% of the world's oil supply. And by uh, 2015, it's actually projected to supply up to 25% of U.S. domestic consumption. And the top four kind of players in uh, African oil are Nigeria, Angola, Libya, and uh, Algeria. And Nigeria is probably what um, the area that people are the most familiar with. If, if you're if you're familiar with with African oil, uh, the African oil situation, it's the 11th largest producer and the eighth largest exporter of crude oil in the world, averaging about of uh, averaging about two million d uh, barrels per day of oil and natural gas, roughly. Um, the government projects, however, or it's, it's, it, it's hoping for, to bring 4 million uh, barrels per day um, to the world market by 2015, although this has become quite complicated by threats from the uh, resistance in the Niger River Delta, and I'm going to get to more on this later. Uh, by 2007, really to, throughout the 2000s, um, oil is roughly about 95 percent of export revenues in Africa, and it's, uh, Nigeria is the fifth largest supplier of crude to the U.S., so clearly very central um, to U.S. oil supplies. But it's not just, uh, it's not just Nigeria that plays a, a, an important role. The entire Gulf of Guinea, which is around the uh, western, um, western Africa, it's a major oil frontier. Oil was just struck recently in Ghana, and places like Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and so on are actually um, 
uh, moving uh, at a quickening pace and starting to rival um, places like Nigeria. But really the, the big news on the source of competition for Nigeria is in Angola. And last year, Angola overtook Nigeria um, with production at 1.8 uh, million barrels per day. Um, and this is, there's a similarly, um, oil is important in East, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about Angola in a little bit. Um, Eastern Africa, though, is also important for oil. Um, less known exploration has been underway in places like Sudan, Kenya, um, and elsewhere along the Indian Ocean, and even in um, the uh, the Horn of Africa. Despite you know the uh, uh, where exploration has been going on, despite um, although somewhat threatened by the crises that have been happening there, companies like ConocoPhillips, Chevron, Total um, have engaged in in exploration in places like Somalia over the years. ExxonMobil has had big projects um, over the works in various parts of Africa and um, people may have heard of the infamous Chad Cameroon pipeline which was the largest single investment in Africa. Uh, it was done by uh, ExxonMobil. Runs a large pipeline that runs through many areas of uh, sort of war-torn areas in Central Africa and um, Exxon which is you know vies with Shell as the biggest the world's biggest oil company. It gets about 30 percent of its of its oil from Africa. So just to sort of to say more generally, oil is exploration in Africa is, is nothing new. I mean, Exxon has claims that it's been in Africa for um, actually for a whole century. But what is new and what I really want to stress here is that is this intensified competition over this oil between the U.S. and its major rivals, as I said, uh, particularly China for strategic control. Um, and this is actually uh, part of, uh, as, as Deepa sort of, uh, you know, began to say that this is part of a larger global picture of intensifying global competition for control of oil and gas production and supply. Worldwide, <coughs> excuse me. Worldwide, a new generation of mainly state-owned companies such as China's CNPC, Saudi Arabia's Aramco, Russia's Gazprom, Venezuela's PDVSA, and Iran's NIOC now control one-third of the world's oil and gas reserves in production, while the major Western companies control just one-tenth of it, um, and only three percent of the reserves. And several years ago, the Financial Times predicted, and I'm going to read a quote here, <coughs> 90% of the new supplies will come from developing countries in the next 40 years. Thus, the new scramble for Africa is a fight between major competing powers for control of new energy sources and profits at a time when they control fewer uh, when they control fewer resources themselves. The race for Africa is all the more important given that conflicts and tensions in other energy-rich areas such as Iraq, Iran, Venezuela have all loosened the West's grip. And that's the end of that quote. And I think that kind of sets the stage. So now, <coughs> do you have one of those cough drops by any chance? Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Um, so. Now, this is where China comes in, because China is, just to turn to this, is a major player, as I said, in the scramble for Africa. It's China's energy needs and oil consumption have doubled in the past decade, and 40% of its oil is imported. So there's um, clearly, um, oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, there, there's, there's clearly an intensified uh, race for um, oil here. Also, besides China, India, Brazil, and Malaysia all have um, oil exploration projects underway in West Africa, also in Sudan, and Brazil and India's trade with China have been jumping massively over the past uh, uh, Brazil and India's trade with Africa, sorry, have been jumping massively over the past few years. But it was China who last year actually overtook the United States as the continent's main trading partner. And this is a significant development with oil revenues that uh, totaling over a hundred billion dollars. China, I mean Angola is China's biggest oil source, overtaking Saudi Arabia and Iran as their biggest supplier. China um, is also heavily involved in the Greater Horn area where billion dollar deals from with Sudan and Ethiopia have established it as a major uh, uh, as a major power and threat to the US and particularly because of the Horn of Africa it's uh, its uh, strategic proximity to the Middle East. China buys 60 percent of Sudan's oil and if you think about some of the debates and conflict over Darfur this is I don't have time to get into it there but this is a little bit of the backdrop to that. <coughs> 
China is also um, important in West Africa, and in the past, just in the past year or two, it's been closing in on a greater um, share of Nigeria's oil reserves. Um, now, China's approach to uh, securing, can people hear me okay? I feel like my, my voice is starting to fade. I'm sorry. Um, China's approach to oil deals has really gone has gone hand in hand with um, with handing out develop with uh, development projects like roads and dams and so on. And Western powers have expressed some anxiety, particularly the U.S. that African states will take these opportunities to kind of um, throw off. Uh, restrictions from the IMF and the World Bank um, and loans and other forms of financial dependence on Europe, uh, on the United States and Europe as well. And, and as one writer put it, who needs the painful medicine of the IMF when China gives easy t terms and builds roads and schools to boot? But China does not, and I'm not arguing here though that China is some kind of gentler, kindler form of imperialism, just like in the 19th century in 19th century colonialism, um, with the, when the Chinese build roads and schools, the goal is to, fil to facilitate resource extraction and bind local government's allegiances. It's not about doing good public works. This intensified uh, competition between economic and strategic interests are driving new militarization on the part of the U.S. and growing talk of a war, in a a war on terror in Africa. And both the Horn and West Africa, East and West, present uh, serious strategic problems for the U.S. Officials fear instability could interfere with their access to the region's oil and minerals. And again, with troops being increasingly tied up in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere, this is um, a, a concern. The Horn has been called by some military analysts as the hottest conflict zone in the world. Um, the wars in the region, Ethiopia, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea, have all created human rights catastrophes. Um, oh, no. I'm really like, okay. Um, can I go a little bit over? Is that, oh. Uh, all right, I'll pick up the speed. Um, all right, let me move. Um, but. Uh, but c control over, and so competition with China also intersects with another security concern, which is ri the rising insurgency in, um, in uh, particularly in West Africa, and threats to investment. People may be familiar with the insurgency in the Niger Delta River uh, River area, where um, oil facilities have um, attacks on oil facilities have forced Nigeria to shut down up to one third of production in that area, which costs up to $1 billion in lost revenue. There's been kidnappings um, and, and, and so on and all types of um, uh, attacks on facilities. And what this has meant concretely is that um, for Shell Oil, for example, the whole Western region has really, um, in terms of their oil, their oil, uh, uh, the blocks have been able to, to um, uh, have not been able to produce. And the Eastern region, which is where the Delta area is, has been reduced to only about 100 barrels per day. And militants have even devised this very ingenious way of getting at the offshore oil rigs with high speed boats and so on. And so what this has meant is big jumps in military spending in Africa over the past um, few years. In 2003, um, at the time of the Iraq invasion, a military base was built in Djibouti, which is in the Horn of Africa area um, near Yemen. Uh, the U.S., um, people may have heard about AFRICOM, which is plans to establish a permanent military base in Africa, which will, they hope to put on the wet in the, in the uh, Gulf of Guinea region. Last year, Obama proposed an $800 million security budget um, for Africa, um, which is, represents a 300% increase. Um, uh, this is Obama's budget for Africa. And this doesn't even include an additional $500 million um, for things like the African Union, AFRICOM itself, peacekeeping, and so on. I'll skip this great quote from Hillary Clinton, but come talk to me after if you want to hear, hear this. Um, and, but I think that the heart of it is, is that um, local, and this is a quote from one, from an, an, an act, African activist, that local Africans are demanding respect um, in terms of resistance and, and, and insurgency. Africans are, re, are demanding respect and a share of what is, after all, um, their oil um, in, in response to the uh, routine vicious uh, suppression in places like Nigeria, Equatorial, Guinea, and elsewhere. And this is what AFRICOM is really all about. Okay, so um, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to have to skip a little bit over um, so, uh, about the, uh, the, the, the post-colonial period. But just to say that um, 
there's a lot to be said for the impact of uh, colonialism and the neoliberal projects on this region in terms of forcing economies to shift towards um, single commodity export economies and in which the World Bank and the IMF um, in, in that context imposed um, st very uh, um, devastating structural adjustment programs and essentially turned Africa just like under colonialism into essentially a one-way conveyor belt of raw materials um, namely oil today which is the um, oh god the picture um, the picture today um, and what that has meant is um, today massive class, class, class polarization in which the Nigerian ruling class um, um, has 85% of the oil wealth and the number of people subsisting on one dollar a day has jumped to today it's more than 70% of, um, of the people. Um, now I guess I will just um, sort of skip over to say, I was going to just mention briefly about the idea of a resource curse as and, and the kind of liberal explanation for what is, um, but I had to skip over a little bit of my um, my own, the, 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 uh, the, the Marxist and materials explanation for, um, for, this, for this kind of, uh, for the distorted oil economies and for the, the nature of, of class polarization. There's a dominant theory um, in a lot of the literature, the development literature on oil in Africa. Um, it's exemplified in, in books like this um, and others which um, uh, attribute the problems of oil, not just in Africa but in other parts of the world, to something called a resource curse, giving it sort of intrinsic properties in which oil um, is the source of underdevelopment and political corruption and a host of other problems. And so just to say that I think that it, this, this is really an ahistorical explanation that, that blames um, uh, uh, Africans and, and, and other peoples of, of, uh, in oil producing countries for problems in which in, uh, um, in w for which imperialism is at, at the root and really lets um, uh, the major powers and U.S. imperialism off and financial institutions off the hook. Um, so just I'm going to just say something very quickly about resistance and then I'll and then I'll wrap up which is I think and I didn't get a chance to say as well about the kind of devastation that these oil companies have played in places like the Niger Delta. There's a fantastic book called Where Vultures Feast um, about um, Shell and human rights in Nigeria. I'd really recommend it. Um, that really paints a picture of um, the, the world's worst oil flaring in the world, a uh, gas flaring and so on. These kinds of conditions have fueled um, both um, uh, uh, the military insurgency like men that I spoke about but also other kinds of resistance, strikes, community organizing, um, uh, uh, sit downs and so on. I think what's happened though is that particularly in places like Nigeria in the face of massive repression, people know about the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and so on, that the space for um, kind of broader grassroots movements has been somewhat closed off and um, I think that th it's in within this context that you've seen the appearance of groups like MEND and other armed um, insurgencies. There was a survey that the World Bank did that said that 36 percent of Nigerian youth were willing to take up arms against the state which I think is sort of a telling um, a telling statistic and there's um, a fantastic uh, ge a geographer named Michael Watts who's written very extensively about the, re the insurgency in the Niger Delta. I'd really encourage people to take it up. But just to say more generally that um, despite the kind of picture that, that's painted for us I think in the media of this kind of um, Nigeria being on the ver verge of being a failed state and, and being reduced to this kind of you know brutal insurgency that Africa has a very long tradition of struggle from the anti-colonial movements to um, the movements of the 1980s and 90s against the World Bank, structural uh, adjustment, privatization and so on, revolts against neoliberalism and I think that that's where um, for those of us who um, on the left who are looking for uh, a, a, a response from below for us to look at, I think that there's great challenges in rebuilding a workers movement in Africa but that Africa today presents I think one of the, the sites of the most, one of the most dynamic sites of imperialist um, rivalry and resistance and African workers are tied into
international capitalism and the potential for a more um, international and permanent revolution to link the developed and developing world. And so I think that this is where our sights um, should lie in terms of uh, building solidarity, also in terms of building resistance to AFRICOM and U.S.'s role here. And finally, just to sort of leave with um, a quick um, sort of figure, Oxfam has predicted that the oil exporting countries in Africa will exceed the amount that they need to, to meet all of their social development needs, poverty and so on, um, in the next few years by $35 billion. So the point is, is that the wealth and the resources exist to meet human need and go far beyond it. And it's a political question of overcoming uh, a system organized on profit and uh, driven um, uh, uh, you know, for oil production for the few that stands in the way. So thank you. Yes, yes. So from Africa, we're oh, going to move. It fell. It fell off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from Africa, we're now going to move to South Asia, and our next speaker is going to be Sadia Tor. Sadia is a, an assistant professor of sociology at the College of Staten Island, City University of New York. She's also a member of Action for a Progressive Pakistan, and there are copies <coughs> of their statement against the war in Afghanistan and Pakistan, if people are interested. Also, I was asked to actually plug the books. Uh, <laughs> books by some of the authors are available for sale after this panel. Uh, cash and credit cards are both accepted. OK. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about um, Afghanistan, but it's actually, um, as you can expect, about much more than Afghanistan, um, but in some way try to explain the current uh, U.S. war, debacle, whatever have you, in the region um, in terms of this, this uh, new uh, scramble for oil and gas reserves, um, in this case in the Central Asian republics, particularly Turkmenistan. Um, so the, um, this particular issue has been discussed a lot in the context of what's being called the new great game and I'm assuming that people are familiar with the concept of the great game uh, the, something that um, Rudyard Kipling, Kipling came up with to explain the great power rivalry between Russia and um, Great Britain um, during the time of British colonialism um, and that now has become the way to sort of uh, for people to frame the, the current um, situation in the region. So, um, uh, uh, th so as I said, the new great game is about control of the oil and gas reserves of the Central Asian republics, um, in, in particular Turkmenistan. Um, and uh, it is therefore a tussle between the great powers for control of energy resources. Um, and this is no secret. Um, it's openly analyzed in U.S. think tanks these days, such as the Brookings Institution, Johns Hopkins, um, SEIS, and Her the Heritage Foundation. And in fact, um, Energy security apparently is the new buzzword um, in, in Western capitals. And in order to get a sense of uh, what this means, um, a, a policy brief to the Canadian government recently described um, it in this form. In the halls of NATO, energy security and national security have become intertwined. Um, at the 2008 summit, um, NATO summit in Bucharest, uh, NATO's leaders pledged that, and I quote, the alliance will continue to consult on the most immediate risks in the field of energy security. So energy security is, I guess, the buzzword to look out for these days. Um, the final commun communique um, uh, from this summit from the summit stated that NATO will engage in supporting the protection of critical energy infrastructure. Um, now this is an interesting formulation because the U.S. has actually been pushing NATO um, to make energy security a, a NATO Article 5 commitment, which um, as I'm sure you know means um, an attack on one is an attack on all, on all, which effectively means that an attack on any um, energy infrastructure, and in this case gas pipelines, um, uh, in the case of the Central Asian Republics, uh, will be construed as an attack on a member nation. Um, so that is a huge leap, as you can imagine. And of course, Europe is very wary of this. Um, and so the, the line that I just read you from the communique is a watered-down version um, of, of the U.S. push. 
So Afghanistan's importance um, in all of this lies in its potential role as an energy bridge, which can underwrite the U.S. geopolitical interests in Asia. Uh, Richard Boucher, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs, said in September 2007, um, and I quote, one of our goals is to stabilize Afghanistan so it can become a conduit and hub between South and Central Asia so that energy can flow to the South and so that the countries of Central Asia are no longer bottled up between two enormous powers of China and Russia, but rather they have outlets to the North and East and the West. And you can imagine where this is coming from. So just to give you a quick sense of who the players are in this great game, and of course not all the players are equal in terms of uh, the power that they hold, nevertheless they are of course the US. Um, Europe has been pushed into it through NATO, I mean, but Europe uh, plays a critical role as I'll explain. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we're stuck. Okay. So the US, um, Europe under NATO, uh, Russia, China, India, Iran, Pakistan, and of course the Central Asian republics um, themselves. So the US's main interest in this region is to undermine Russian. Um, Iranian and to some extent Chinese uh, dominance of the oil and gas market. But China is actually not so much of uh, a threat to the US because it's actually, um, it needs the gas for itself, um, the Turkmenistan uh, or the Central Asian Republic gas for itself. It's, it's more about limiting uh, Russian and Iranian influence over Europe. Um, because Europe actually imports most of its gas through Russia. Um, and the other alternatives um, that are available seem to all more or less need to pass through Iran at this point, which, as you can imagine, does not make the US very happy. Um, so again, just to give you a, a sense of um, you know, what Iran and Russia mean to Europe, Iran has the third largest oil reserves in the world and the second largest natural gas reserves. Um, Russia controls 26% of the European gas market and is expected to have a 33% share in 2020. And together, Russia and Iran control 20% of the world's oil reserves and 50% of its gas reserves, right? So the importance of the Central Asian republics to all the players in the great game can be gauged by the following. Turkmenistan is said to have the world's fourth biggest natural gas reserves, while Kazakhstan is supposed to have the largest oil reserves in Central Asia, said to be three times those of the North Sea. Currently, Turkmenistan exports almost all its gas to Russia via, via Kazakhstan, which Russia eventually sells to Europe. Russia, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan recently signed a deal to construct a new gas pipeline to replace the old uh, one which dates from the Soviet era. The U.S. has expressed strong concern about European energy dependence on Russia. Let me just provide a quick rundown of the different proposed pipelines to supply gas and oil to Europe to give you a sense of how the tussle between U.S., Russia, and Iran plays itself out. So there is Russia's South Stream project, which is about taking Siberian natural gas under the Black Sea to Bulga Bulgaria, then to Italy and Austria, bypassing Turkey and Ukraine. Russia's Nord Stream, um, which is uh, controlled, uh, has 51% of the shares are owned by Gazprom, the rest owned by German and Dutch companies, which goes from Western Russia under the Baltic Sea to Germany. Um, there's the EU's proposed Nabucco project, which is supported by the US to bring gas from Azerbaijan to Europe via Turkey. However, Azerbaijan doesn't have enough gas to supply Europe, so Turkey wants to tap into Iran and Turkmenistan's resources, which of course kind of undermine the whole idea as far as the US is concerned. Um, so Washington wants to short circuit the Iran-Turkey-Europe possibility by bringing Central Asian oil and gas to Azerbaijan via pipelines built under the Caspian Sea. This of course is opposed by Russia. Either way, Turkey is crucial um, to, to these various proposals and is using this as leverage in its bid to join the EU. So that will be interesting to watch. Um, China, India and Pakistan are all in the market for oil and gas from the Central Asian Republics. All three also have geopolitical interests in the region, India and Pakistan in Afghanistan and China in Pakistan's Balochistan province. But let's step back for a moment to the beginnings of this new great game. The breakup of the Soviet Union opened up the Central Asian republics and their vast energy resources to the rest of the world, at least in theory. Um, the big question for everyone but the Russians uh, was how to get this treasure out of the landlocked area of Central Asia. And it wasn't a question for uh, the Russians because the old Soviet um, pipelines were all designed to um, you know, bring the gas from Central and oil from Central Asian uh, republics to um, Russia.
However, the geographical location of these republics made it tricky to do so for the U.S., surrounded as they were by Russia and China. Afghanistan became the answer to this dilemma. To the north, it borders three of the five Central Asian republics, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan. And to the south, it borders Pakistan. Um, the, I, and of course, there is the border with Iran too, which is also strategically important um, for the U.S. for different reasons. The idea for um, the, the big pipeline that um, sort of the U.S. has been pushing, uh, which is called TAPI now for the initials of the four uh, countries that are involved, used to be called TAP, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, so originally it was TAP and now it's TAPI and we, we you know, this, it's, it's really, yes, it, it gets more and more interesting. Um, so it seemed perfect to use Afghanistan as the energy bridge between the Central Asian Republics and South Asia um, and thereby um, to the rest of the world. Under the Taliban regime in the 1990s, two consortia were competing for the right to take on this project, one led by Unicol and the other by uh, Argentina's Bridas. In 1997, six international energy companies with Unicol in the lead and, Turkmen and Turkmenistan uh, formed the Central Asian Gas Pipeline Limited, or Cent Gas, to link Turkmenistan with Pakistan, um, and was, you know, the idea was that it would be extendable into India. Um, the U.S. Congress uh, passed the Silk Road Strategy Act in 1999, days before the bombing of Serbia, which clearly identified American geostrategic interests from the Black Sea to Western China uh, with building a mosaic of American protectorates in Central Asia and militarizing the Eurasian Energy Corridor. So unsurprisingly, the, you know, what we're seeing happen here has a, has a fairly long history, at least longer than um, many, many people seem to think. From 1997 to 2001, the U.S. government was in nego negotiations with the Taliban regime which it saw at that point as a source of stability for Afghanistan. Taliban representatives were invited to Houston and Washington for talks in 1997 under the aegis of Unicol and once again in March 2001. Talks eventually broke down because the Bush regime wanted the Taliban to form a government of national unity which would include the northern tribes and because the Taliban insisted on transit, transit fees which were unacceptab unacceptable to Washington. And it's crucial to note, of course, um, that the talks broke down in August 2001. Um, you know, no conspiracy theories here, but, you know, it is interesting to note that. October 2001, um, Afghanistan is attacked, the Taliban ousted um, and replaced by Hamid Karzai as the interim president of the Afghan Transitional Administration, and Zalmay Khalilzad is appointed the U.S. Special Presidential o um, Envoy for Afghanistan. And um, as we know, both of them had connections to Unicol and, um, mm -hmm. and of course, long uh, associations with the U.S. State Department. In 2002, Karzai signs the um, Memorandum of Understanding with Musharraf and the President of Turkmenistan on the TAP pipeline project. In 2006, however, Russia agreed to pay Turkmenistan the 40% markup it was demanding, and in turn, Turkmenistan handed its new gas fields over to Russia for exploration, besides promising Russia its gas surplus through 2009. Turkmenistan sub subsequently bowed out of any U.S.-backed Trans-Caspian pipeline project. Washington is now busy trying to court it back in order to make TAPI or some version of it viable, as well as the other dead duck of a project, Nabucco. TAPI has also been dead on arrival because of Afghanistan deteriorati Afghanistan's deteriorating security situation. A testimony to the hubris behind the U.S. idea that putting its plan in place was a simple matter of a quick invasion and regime change in Afghanistan. The U.S. has refused to let the TAPI pipe dream die, however. In 2008, the Gas Pipeline Framework Agreement was signed by reps of the four countries, supported by uh, the Asian Development Bank, despite security concerns. Commitment, the commitment was to begin the pipeline by 2010. Um, bear in mind that TAPI would cut through Herat in western Afghanistan, through Nimroz and Helmand provinces, which are the site of Taliban and an assorted guerrilla activity, and where the U.S. has built a new mega base, um, Camp Leatherhead. In the meantime, Iran proposed a much more pragmatic and secure alternative to Pakistan and India, um, the Iran-Pakistan-India Pipeline, or EP. Um, Russia's Gazprom has expressed willingness to help build it um, because Russia's interest in that is that this diverts Iranian oil away uh, from uh, Europe, the European market. Um, and uh, British Petroleum has publicly expressed interest in building the section in Pakistan. India's participation had been held up by a pricing squabble um, and now by security concerns vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan and a recent nuclear power deal made with the U.S. But India hasn't officially pulled out. Iran and Pakistan recently signed on the dotted line, despite immense pressure on Pakistan from Washington um, to scuttle the deal. 
China has declared its interest in this deal should India officially pull out. The pipeline would then run from uh, Gwadar, and I'll uh, talk about Gwadar in a second, to Xinjiang province across the Karakorum Highway, which, Chinese, which was built um, in Pakistan with the help of Chinese engineers back in the 1960s. China is a more welcome partner for Pakistan than India for obvious reasons. Um, speaking of China, and I want to sort of race through this, um, Saudi Arabia used to be China's main supplier of uh, oil and gas, but now Iran is a close number two. Chinese companies have committed to investing no less than a staggering $120 billion in Iran's energy sector over the past five years. Sinopec has just signed another MOU with the National Iranian Oil Refining and Distribution Company to invest an additional $6.5 billion to build oil refineries in Iran. Um, China is clear, clearly therefore not following uh, the U.S. imposed sanctions on Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia offered China oil at better rates, uh, but China refused. Um, Obama hinted in his recent visit to China in November that the U.S. would not be able to prevent Israel from attacking Iran um, as a way to get China to sign on to har harsher sanctions, but of course the Chinese are not listening. China has also invested in the Central Asian pipeline link linking Turkmenistan to China's Xinjiang province, and it is set to open by 2013. Um, Kazakhstan has 3% of the world's proven oil reserves and its largest oil fields are not far from the Chinese border. Um, China has also um, made Turkmenistan sign an agreement th uh, that says that no NATO bases would be allowed in Turkmenistan. Um, so the Chinese role in the Great Game also extends to its relationship to Pakistan. In May 2001, China agreed to underwrite the Gwadar port project, cementing its relationship with Pakistan, but also scoring a geostrategic advantage for itself vis-a-vis -vis India and the U.S. Uh, work started on the project in March 2002, and the port has just recently opened. Um, according to Pepe Escobar, the future of the EPIC, EP versus TAPI, may hinge on a single magic word, Gwadar. Gwadar, originally a fishing village, is a natural deep sea port along the Makran coastline of the Pakistani province of Balochistan, 250 miles from the Straits of Hormuz, through which almost 40% of world's, the world's oil supplies flow, which makes it strategic for many reasons, economic as well as geopolitical. For the Pakistani state, it is the perfect solution um, to several problems. It could relieve the severe congestion at the Karachi port, and it is further up the coastline from India than Karachi, thereby providing Pakistan with the strategic depth along its coastline that it needs. In fact, Pakistan has built a major naval base here. It could provide the landlocked Central Asian republics, Afghanistan and China's um, Xinjiang region, a much needed point of access to Gulf ports and the Arabian Sea. There has been talk of setting up a free trade zone or an export processing zone here with special concessions provided to Chinese companies. China's main interest in Gwadar is twofold. Increased piracy in the Straits of Malacca have made it prudent to have an alternative route for crude oil imports from Iran and Africa via Xinjiang. Chinese officials have publicly stated their interest in turning the port into a transit terminal. It also al allows China to monitor U.S. naval activity in the Persian Gulf, Indian activity in the Arabian Sea, and future U.S.-Indian maritime cooperation in the Indian Ocean. Needless to say, India is not happy with this, and of course the U.S. would much rather have control of Gwadar itself. However, decades of neglect by Islamabad and the more recent military occupation of the province by the Pakistani army has left a rightfully bitter taste in the mouth of Balochi nationalists who have retaliated of late by blowing up gas pipelines and attacking Chinese engineers working on various development projects in the province. Balochistan, th therefore, while a prize, is a double-edged one for the powers that vie for control over it, um, despite or perhaps because of its strate strategic importance in the new great game. Um, as Pepe Escobar puts it, whoever, win, whoever wins if Gwadar really becomes part of the liquid war, Pakistan will finally become a key transit corridor for either Iranian gas from the monster South Pars field heading for China or a great deal of the Caspian gas from Turkmenistan heading Europewards. Um, Pakistan will then also be a pivotal place for both NATO and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. However, that will depend greatly on what happens in Balochistan, and a lot of that has to do with how the war in neighboring Afghanistan continues to spill over into the province and how and actually if Islamabad is able to give Balochis what they have been justifiably demanding, a greater share in the national pie and greater control over their natural resources. However, even if Pakistan's civil military establishment could bring itself to concede to Balochi demands in a substantive way, it is no longer clear if this would be enough now given the justifiable rise in Baloch separatism. If the last few years have taught us anything, however, about the politics of the new great game, is that nothing can be taken for granted. Thank you. Yes.
Okay, from Central and South Asia, we now move to the Middle East, and uh, the first country under discussion in the Middle East is Iraq. Our next speaker will be Michael Schwartz. Michael is a professor of sociology at SUNY Long Island, and he's written extensively about uh, Iraq, and uh, his book, his excellent book, War Without End, is available for sale um, after this panel is over. So, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> the media strikes again. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Iraq. Um, so, um, I, I assume because you're here at the left forum and you're here at this session, I don't have to convince you that the war in Iraq had a lot to do with oil. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good. Um, so I'll leave that part out, but I do want to um, very briefly outline uh, some of the oil goals the United States had when it entered Iraq back in 2003, uh, and then bring that forward to the current situation, which is highly in flux, uh, and nothing is settled. And I think it's a, a, it makes it interesting that all of the sort of the equation of forces, many of which are the same as what we hear about in uh, these other presentations, the great game, the, uh, uh, the existence of local resistance of various sorts to exploitation, the attempt to, um, to um, make different countries conveyor belts for raw materials and so on and so forth, are all part of what's going on in Iraq now. And nothing is settled, which I think uh, our sense, just from the general media and from our in incapacity to get good information, is that maybe everything's settled, uh, even if we don't know what it is. And I don't think anything's settled there, and so I think it's very interesting to sort of point towards that, um, that imbalance that's going on right now so that people can keep their eyes on it. When the United States went into Iraq, even before, right, they had been planning, uh, starting with the, um, even before this, but officially with the Cheney Energy Commission, a very serious and careful strategic plan for what they wanted to have happen in Iraq and the centerpiece of it of course was what they wanted to have happen with Iraqi oil. Um, and basically the Cheney Energy Commission uh, among a great many other proposals they had for Iraq had three key elements in what they expected to achieve from an invasion of Iraq. Uh, one was quadrupling production. Uh, Iraq though it had the third largest reserves in the world, proven reserves in the world, was way down the list in the number, the amount being produced, largely as a result of the sanctions and the devastation of Iraq by Saddam's various wars. Um, so it was running at about 2.5 million barrels per year um, and could, in principle, be raised to 12 million barrels per day. I mean, I said per year, I meant per day. Right, but get it up to eight and the United States probably would have been pretty happy with that. Um, secondly, that, and this is crucial, is to take control of the spigot. That is to say, to have some ability to determine the level of production in Iraq once its production ability got up to let's say eight million barrels or 12 million barrels, that the United States or somebody, not Saddam Hussein, and not a nationalist government of any sort, and in fact, not a government that was loyal to OPEC would make the decisions about production levels. Uh, and the third goal was more generally to remove from the Iraqi economy the dominant force of the Iraqi government and to make, to op uh, you know, they used the phrase open up the Iraqi economy, uh, but it also, you know, meant the full-fledged neoliberal reforms and in particular the oil economy in Iraq, which was quite elaborate and very well developed. There's uh, areas of Iraq that had whole industrial districts around oil production. Uh, these kinds of things are very dangerous from the point of view of, of having the free flow of Iraqi oil. Just a, a, a small piece of this, the, the Cheney Energy Commission, more or less explicitly, was looking at this strategy. Now, you know, we've heard a lot about natural gas, but of course, in the oil world, right, there isn't, there isn't much new reserves to find. And when they have a great new strike, maybe that great new strike could produce two million barrels a day, right? 
Whereas in Iraq, you can talk about increasing production by six, seven, eight million barrels per day without even finding new oil, right? I mean, it's a completely different order of magnitude here. Uh, it is the gold rush of all oil. Um, and, and there's a lot of very, very informed experts who think that the amount of unfound oil reserves in Iraq is quadruple what they currently have, and that Iraq eventually will be considered to have more oil than Saudi Arabia, which has been the undisputed champion for the last 50 years. So we're talking about a tremendous, a trem you know, in this great game, in this world of shortage of oil, Iraq is the place to go. And from the Cheney Energy Commission point of view, this represented an alternative to alternate fuels. Right? This is the way we don't have to get into this whole alternate fuels, renewable energy, and all of the economic difficulty that renewable energy was going to cause for the f established political economic forces in the United States. Right? And even in the in United States' version of the, global, uh, of the global economy. So all this is hinging on the Iraqi on the Iraqi effort now. The Iraqi effort becomes the centerpiece of it, and we're all familiar with the fact that the day after 9-11, you know, Rumsfeld walks into the National Security Council and says, okay, we're going to attack Iraq now, right? I mean, he wants to go straight for Iraq. He's been waiting for the chance. Uh, and, um, and they have to wait a while. They have to wait, all, you know, a year and a half before they can do it. But it's already on the agenda before 9-11, and it's placed firmly on the agenda by 9-11, and then it's just a matter of time. So now we come forward all the way to here, and what have, what have they accomplished in this period? Well, on the quadrupling of uh, Iraqi oil production, in the six years since the invasion, <laughs> Iraqi oil production has declined, not increased, right? It had zero success uh, on that. Um, same on the question of control, even though one month after the United States completed the ouster of the Saddam Hussein regime, they promulgated a law, right, Bremer promulgated a law saying that we're going to deliver, we're, we're going to deliver the, the oil fields of Iraq to the control of international oil companies with the mandate to double, triple, quadruple oil production. One month after he takes power, Bremer says this, right, and lays down these laws. Nothing has happened as a result of this. There's been resistance to this at every level, including, by the way, in the international oil companies who are very uncomfortable with the idea they're going to invest a huge amount of money, and then a nationalist Iraqi government is just going to renationalize what they've invested their money for. So even the oil companies are a little hesitant about this, right? Uh, they want a fully, uh, a, a fully subservient Iraqi government before they're willing to, you know, hazard this risk. And now we come to now, right? And um, may, I mean, for the first time since, oil, since the United States went into Iraq in the year 2009, the word oil actually appeared in a headline on the front page of the New York Times, <laughs> right? I mean, all this time, uh, not even in a headline, not even in the, some of the articles. The, the reporters, who are a lot, you know, are pretty savvy people, at least some of them, would put them in the tail end of the article, right? But even, a, even on the front page, the whole text on the front page, they could never mention oil. Now they could mention oil because the Iraqi government has sort of taken everything in hand and said, we're going to find a way to extract this oil, right? We need it, we want it, so we're going to find a way to extract it. And they set up these arrangements, right? in which they were going to give out bids for oil. And the year of 2009 was a year in which these, uh, these bids were taken and finally kind of consolidated by the end of the year. And the deals that they offered are very interesting, and we have no firm idea what is going to actually happen with these deals, even though they've been signed for any number of reasons. There's a tremendous amount of resistance in Iraq for what was done. And by the way, there's a tremendous amount of resistance from the United States for what was done. Right. Now, the United States had been pushing and trying to force the Iraqis in all manner of ways. They actually had a full-scale negotiation in which they delivered the Iraq government into the hands of the IMF on the basis of the IMF saying you have to open up the entire economy and you have to give over control of oil to international uh, oil companies. That was in 2004. That didn't work. They've tried everything right. And this government said, okay, we're going to put up bids, and we're going to let the international oil companies come in, 
right? But we're going to do what's called technical service contracts rather than production sharing contracts. And the difference being is we're going to be in charge of deciding how much is, is produced. And what they're going to do is just come in and they're going to build up our, our capacity and then we're going to take over and run the thing. Or if we have them run the thing, they'll run it under our control, right? What Iraq actually did, and it's uh, very interesting because, you know, they have this idea of the resource curse. And they can look all over the Middle East and say, look at the resource curse. And they can look at Africa. And the one place they can't look at for the resource curse is Norway, which also is a big, <laughs> oh, wait a second, it's also a big oil producer. It's a tremendous oil. They got a big <coughs> chunk of the North Sea oil, right? And the oil turned not into a curse, but actually tremendous resource flows that have really benefited the country as a whole, right? Ironically, uh, and this is little known, is that the person who actually masterminded the Norwegian government private partnership in Norway was an Iraqi petroleum engineer uh, who left Norway. He left for Norway. His wife was from Norway. He was from Iraq. They met in England, of course. And um, he, he had been living in Iraq, and he moved to Norway for bu uh, personal reasons and became the head of their... Uh, of their plan, and he devised this plan that actually <laughs> defeated the resource curse. He's been in Iraq lately, and the government plan in Iraq is, is kind of modeled off of the Norwegian <laughs> plan. And the idea is, is to take advantage of the technical skills of the international oil companies, right, but maintain control for the Iraqi government. Now, we have a very corrupt Iraqi client government, right, uh, and so you can't be sure that the government is going to uh, implement anything that serves the people, so we have to keep that part of it in mind. But look at what the deals they made. Well, the first, there's, there's several elements to these deals that are worth thinking about. One of them is that instead of giving a share of the production profits, they asked the international oil companies to take a flat rate for the barrels of oil that they produced. And the flat rate the government asked for was two dollars a barrel. We'll give you two dollars a barrel. Now we all know that that oil sells for seventy dollars a barrel. So if you're an oil company, you say, "Wait a minute here, <laughs> you know, seventy dollars a barrel. You're only giving me two dollars, right?" Um, and and the international oil company said, "No deal. A minimum of twenty-five dollars a barrel, and we want to be able to go higher if the the price goes higher." So for most of 2009, they refused to bid on it. But the good old Chinese National Oil Company broke the boycott, right? Because the Chinese are interested, we've already heard this, right? The Chinese have a kind of broader interest in their relationship to oil. They're not really looking at these oil contracts from the point of view of maximizing profits. They're looking at oil contracts from the point of view of creating enduring economic relationships with these countries. And this is as good a way to do it as any. In fact, there's a lot better than most ways to do it because we're going to start building <laughs> pipelines and the whole infrastructure. We're going to be supplying all this expertise and we're going to have the day-to-day -day control over what's going on there and we're going to create a long-term relationship. And as a result of the Chinese being willing to break this boycott, the other national oil companies to start with, and then finally the big international, multinational oil companies began having to bid for these low prices. So now they're in contracts in which they're not going to get super profits out of it. But the question now becomes, will they, who's going to decide how much is being produced? They're talking about increasing the capacity in Iraq to 12 million barrels a day which means that Iraq could basically control OPEC. With that kind of capacity, Iraq could say to OPEC, whatever you're doing, here's what we want to do, which is what Saudi Arabia has been doing for decades. Suddenly, the Trump card is going to pass to the Iraqi government, right? And the question then becomes for us, and for, by the way, you know, for us just thinking about it, uh, or trying to do something about it, and for the Uni United States government is, oh my God, are they going to have this kind of power? Right? Um, so there's two ways for the United States government to go with this. One is to get control of that government, mm -hmm. right? To have a, a real client government there, right? And the other is to get control of those decisions into the international oil company's hands. And of course, the U.S. is pushing in both directions at once, right? And so that's, that's a really uh, a, a division. Third, third place to look in this, right, is the government is saying we're going to have. <coughs> 
partnership for every one of these deals. They got a 27, 25% partnership for the Iraqi national oil companies, right? And they have a 25% partnership or more in every one of these contract deals, which are mostly, by the way, with national oil companies, right? And only, only a couple of them are with the private international oil companies, right? Um, so they're looking to gain, to gain control. So here's their device for gaining control. But within that, the oil companies in Iraq, right, are themselves kind of an independent force, as they are in most countries. The national oil companies are an independent force. And they have a big stake in getting control. And one of the things, the way this plays out, and this is very important, is who's the workforce going to be? The international oil companies, all of them, nationally owned or privately owned, they want to bring in their own workforces, right? And of course, this, is, this means that the multiplier effect, this is where the resource curse really gets immediate, right? <coughs> now, Iraq has a very powerful oil workers union that reformed itself the moment the Saddam Hussein regime fell and has been very successful in resisting all sorts of things. Just to give one example, the United States tried to deliver control of the Basra port, which is their main oil port, 80% of the oil goes out there, to Bechtel and let them run the whole port. The workers went on strike and defeated that, right? They just defeated that straight ahead. And they are very well organized and they're very determined and very public in their opposition to any kind of operational control for the international oil companies, right? And they've already started, right, with resistance to the very first small project came in, it was run by the uh, CN, CNPC, the Chinese National Oil Company, and they were bringing in foreign workers, and it has not only been a strike there, right, but there's been systematic sabotage of the effort, right, which has been going on all over Iraq for the last six years, when international oil companies have tried to come in and start exploiting their oil reserves. By the way, the insurgency very <laughs> systematically attacked the oil, uh, the oil pipelines, which are just, you know, absurdly easy to stop. I mean, when, when you hear in these, other, uh, in these other locations that oil, right, that there's resistance to oil and that, you know, th this is going on, almost all the resistance has the same aspect to it. Hit the pipelines. You got a thousand miles of pipeline, all you, get, you break it anywhere you want. And you not only can break it and, and stop them from getting the oil, you can siphon off oil on your own and take it to the black market. So the insurgency has been fueling itself in Iraq since the very beginning with oil, right? And, um, and also depriving, uh, depriving the government, the United States, and the international oil companies of this oil, right? And this resistance is continuing, and, uh, you know, it's not well, but, you know, for example, the pipeline to the going out the north has been cut more than it's been open, even after a deal was signed to keep it open. Uh, and this resistance is going on, and the struggle is very explicitly, the workers, for example, very explicit. They're saying, we want this oil controlled by a national oil company, we want all the employees to be uh, Iraqis, and we want all the technicians to be Iraqis. That's the, that's the oil workers' point of view, and they have lots of parliament on their side for that. All of the opposition parties that have run in the recent election all ran on a policy that even this contract, which we can all see with our naked eye when we see these contracts that it's way far away what the United States originally wanted, right, is still unacceptable to them. And that they want these things abrogated, that the parliament has never been asked to, to, uh, to approve them and that it must approve them. And there could well be a new parliament that will be insisting on this. And of course, in the backstage, the United States is pushing in completely the other direction. Everything's up in the air, folks. Everything's up <laughs> in the air. And what's at stake is the trump card of international oil right now. Thank you. I have my watch as well, but go ahead. Oh, let me keep that. Right. Um, so my name is Deepa Kumar, and I will be talking about Saudi Arabia. As people know, Saudi Arabia is home to the <coughs> largest oil reserves in the world. Uh, Saudi Arabia sits on 25% of known oil reserves. And I'm going to be talking about the relationship, the so-called special relationship between the US and Saudi Arabia in light of um, oil. 
Um, this is part of actually a bigger project, and this chapter is called Islam and Oil, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'll just focus on oil. Right, so for over the last uh, six to seven decades, the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia has been largely harmonious. Beginning with the first oil concession in 1933, the U.S. has relied on Saudi Arabia for oil, and Saudi Arabia has been dependent on the U.S. for its security needs. Um, through decades of both Republican and Democratic <laughs> presidents, um, you know, this relationship has continued, and um, Brzezinski characterized, Brzezinski National Security Advisor under Carter, Carter characterized this relationship as an asymmetrical interdependence. And, uh, you know, so despite the uh, appalling human rights record that uh, Saudi Arabia has, um, its archaic political system, and so forth, this interdependence has shielded it uh, from criticisms in the U.S. until, of course, the events of 9 11. And when it became known that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals, uh, it caused a furor in the United States. You know, public opinion plummeted. But more importantly, a section of the political elite led by the neocons actually started to launch very public criticisms <coughs> of Saudi Arabia, even advocating a severing of ties. Um, I'll just give you a little flavor of this. In 2002, a RAND Corporation analyst was invited to speak uh, before the Defense Policy Board. Uh, and he stated that Saudi Arabia has, quote, been active at er every level of the terror chain, end quote. And he went on to add that the country supports all of the U.S.'s uh, uh, enemies and attacks its allies and so on, and declared, therefore, that it is, quote, the kernel of evil, the prime mover, the most dangerous opponent, end quote. Now, uh, this person was actually invited to this event by Richard Pearl, who you may know is a leading uh, <laughs> neocon voice and just happened to be the chairperson of the Defense Policy Board um, at that time. Now, not so coincidentally, prior to this presentation, uh, Pearl and his allies had actually initiated two articles in the mainstream <laughs> uh, media, actually in the right-wing media, one in commentary and the other weekly uh, in Weekly Standard, basically making the same sort of argument. And the crux of their argument was this. It was that Saudi Arabia could no longer be trusted to be an ally and that the U.S. should therefore prepare to take over its oil fields. And by the way, uh, plans to take over Saudi Arabia's oil fields have been in the works at least since the 1970s. So this is not new. All right. Now, a whole host of books then appeared uh, which made similar arguments that Saudi Arabia is a sponsor of Islamic fundamentalism and global terrorism and so on and so forth. Here's how uh, Robert Baer, a former CIA officer, put it in his book, Sleeping with the Enemy. He said that the Saudi uh, uh, monarchy funds extremists and therefore the U.S. should, quote, consider <coughs> seizing the oil fields, end quote. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of the criticism uh, that was coming from those quarters. Additionally, people um, um, argue that uh, there's a special relationship actually between individuals uh, in the two countries, right? People may remember even on the left, Fahrenheit 9-11, the film, Michael Moore as well seems to give credence to such arguments that there's a connection between uh, the Bush family and the Saudi family. And what all of these arguments, of course, <coughs> overlook is the structural relationship. And the key uh, 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 sort of, you know, connection is oil for security. That is what ties the two countries together, not so much personal uh, uh, relationships. Now, the congressional level, various bills and motions were put into, uh, 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 put on the floor to censure Saudi Arabia in all sorts of ways. But suffice it to say that nine years after 9-11, relations between the two countries have now more or less been normalized. And that's because at its root, again, this is all about oil for security. So what I'd like to do is really sort of lay out the history of this logic and the history of the relationship between the US and Saudi Arabia <laughs> to show how oil plays a key part. So I mentioned earlier that the US's relationship with Saudi Arabia begins in 1933 when Standard Oil of California, or SoCal, struck a deal to do oil exploration. Um, for Saudi Arabia, this oil concession was actually a very, uh, it, it was a much needed way to generate resources. And for the U.S., uh, for, the, for the oil companies in the U.S., this deal with Saudi Arabia allowed them to bypass British monopoly over oil fields uh, in the Gulf. Now, at the time, that is before World War II, uh, you know, in, uh, in the context of World War I and so forth, uh, Britain really was the main hegemon in the region. Britain had a powerful hold over oil in the region through a company known as the Iraq Petroleum Company, the IPC. 
And uh, the IPC had all <laughs> sorts of rules. You know, you had to make deals with the IPC, and then you had to follow the rules set by IPC. And so the deal with Ibn Saud actually allowed SoCal to operate outside of IPC rules, and they then form a subsidiary called CASOC, the Californian, California Arabian Standard Oil Company, which along with a couple of other oil companies would go on to form Aramco, the Arab American uh, company in 1944. <coughs> now at first there was no oil in Saudi Arabia, which was quite uh, distressing, both to the, to the US as well as to Saudi Arabia. Uh, it was only in 1938, five years after the first concession, that oil was found in Daman. And then it was only in 1948, right, fully 15 years later, when the largest deposit of oil in the world was struck in Gawar. And it was at that point, really, that uh, Aramco, as well as Saudi Arabia, <laughs> would become uh, a serious contender in the oil market and on the world stage. Now, um, despite the discovery of oil in 1938, uh, Ibn Saud actually needed a lot of external support to run the country. And at first it was Britain, actually, that you know, uh, gave a bunch of the finances and also controlled Saudi Arabia. But the US, of course, comes in quite quickly with aid through the Lend-Lease program and so on. And here's how FDR put it. He said, the kingdom was, quote, vital for the defense of the USA, end quote. And this was also the time that a State Department official called Saudi Arabia the greatest material prize um, in the world, or something along those lines. I forget the exact, uh, um, exact details. Um, additionally, bases were set up uh, around this time. Now, um, what happens after World War II is that the baton is now passed from Britain to the United States. And many theorists have argued <coughs> that actually this does not happen in a context of rivalry. In fact, it happens in a very smooth uh, 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 kind of way. Um, whereas, uh, but, but what's different in the passing of, of the baton is that whereas British imperial strategy involved direct involvement in the local affairs of colonized nations, the signing of treaties, and the presence of political advisors, and so on, the US actually preferred a less direct strategy that involved private corporations and military bases. Um, and so the US relied on Aramco to do most of its uh, work. And um, um, in essence, despite the tensions between, there were some tensions between Britain and the uh, United States, uh, both countries were <laughs> committed to what Daniel Jurgen refers to as the post-war petroleum order, because both of them benefited from this, uh, uh, from this uh, agreement. I'll just say a little bit about the post-war petroleum order. Now, the post-war era in the US saw the greatest growth in the economy in the 20th century. Um, Jürgen argues that it was oil, actually, that fueled this growth, not only in, in the US, but in Europe and later Japan as well. And a part of the economic <coughs> growth in the US was the creation of a consumer society based on the purchase of you know, copious consumer goods. Um, one of these goods was cars. So in 1945, there were 26 million cars on the road. Uh, five years later, 1950, there were 40 million. And in the same period, gasoline sales go up by 45%. Um, and in fact, up until 1947, US exports of oil actually exceeded imports. But this would change in 1948, bringing into existence the ominous phase that's still used today, foreign oil, right? We've got to reduce our dependence on <laughs> foreign oil. All right, um, now in addition to domestic growth and consumption, at least since World War I, oil has come to be associated with security, as several panelists mentioned. Um, and as Daniel Jurgen argues again, the lessons of World War II, the growing economic significance of oil, and the magnitude of Middle East oil resources all served in the context of the developing Cold War with the Soviet Union to define the preservation of access to that oil as the prime element in American and British <coughs> and Western in European security. Europe, as we know, emerged from World War II devastated and desperately in need of energy resources to rebuild itself. And the Marshall Plan was to aid in the achievement of this goal. And it was, in, in part, the Marshall Plan was really based on the idea of having access to cheap oil from the Middle East. So, uh, and for Britain, of course, this meant access to oil from the Gulf that could be purchased in sterling rather than dollars. Um, now, these were really the conditions that led to the creation of the post-war petroleum order. And here's how it's described by Nathan Satino. <laughs> the post-war petroleum order uh, is a set of arrangements that sustained both recovery 
and militarization in Western Europe and reconciled uh, growing U.S. domestic consumption with escalating demands of American Cold War foreign policy. For the U.S., a net importer of oil from 1948, Gulf Petroleum provided a means for fueling foreign policy in Europe without siphoning off the Western Hemisphere reserves crucial for domestic prosperity. The post-war petroleum order consisted of tangible infrastructure for delivering Mideast oil to, the, to Europe, including two pipelines and the Suez Canal, but most importantly, it involved a series of relationships among producing states, transit countries, major petroleum firms, and the Western powers. So that's what it is in a nutshell, right? It's about getting cheap Middle Eastern oil to uh, <laughs> Europe for its development as part of the Marshall Plan. And it's not just about the oil producing countries, it's also about the transit countries because you've got to have the pipelines and so forth, but it's also about the, uh, um, uh, the oil companies and so forth. Now, in the case of Saudi Arabia, the post-war petroleum order actually suited the needs of the ruling Saud family very well. In return for uh, military and financial assistance, Saudi Arabia offered political support for the U.S.'s activities uh, in the region. And Ibn Saud, of course, is known <coughs> to have really impressed um, people in the United States with the following statement, quote, if you find a communist in Saudi Arabia, I will hand you his head, end quote. Mm -hmm. So, of course, those were all the credentials that were needed at the time uh, uh, to become an ally of the United States. Now, um, what this meant is maintaining the post-war petroleum order, <laughs> not only uh, in the broader region, but also in Saudi Arabia, meant, and I'm skipping through a lot of this, is squashing every form of dissent that emerged in that country, right? And so you have oil workers strikes in the 1950s, you see the rise of Arab nationalist uh, uh, organizations, there's even a free <laughs> princes movement, you know, inspired by the free officers movement and so on. Aramco and the Saudi monarchy made sure that any kind of reform that would squash their oil uh, uh, for security arrangement uh, would absolutely not have any tenure, would be immediately and totally destroyed. Um, and so this relationship actually continues through the 1970s. Um, and after the oil uh, embargo of 1973, Nixon actually comes up with this very clever plan, and that is to get Saudi Arabia to invest more heavily in the U.S. economy. And the logic behind this is if Saudi Arabia is invested in the U.S., they will not be <coughs> tempted to, uh, you know, to uh, launch another embargo because it would affect their, uh, their uh, bottom line as well. Mm -hmm. And the strategy really has continued. It was started in the 70s, but it's con continued so that by the 21st century, Saudi Arabia had invested nearly half a trillion dollars in the U.S., mainly in stocks and bonds, but also in bank deposits and real estate. Two minutes. Okay. So I'll come to a close with the last part of what I want to talk about, and that is <laughs> U.S.-Saudi relations after the Cold War. Well, um, let's see. What should I skip? Okay, um, let, let me just go to the context after 9-11. Um, essentially, um, as I said at the start of my talk, there's, there, there's a debate, there has been a debate among the political elite as to how to view Saudi Arabia. And there were various sort of strategies put forward to reduce dependence on uh, Saudi oil, including invading Iraq and <coughs> trying to get Iraq to actually be an alternative source of fuel for the United States. But as Michael laid out quite clearly, that plan has not quite worked out and doesn't look like it's going to work out anytime um, you know, in, the, in, in the near future. Additionally, people may remember in the 2004 elections, um, en energy security was a big part of the debates between McCain and, uh, uh, um, and? <laughs> Kerry. <laughs> oh my God, he's, he's so forgettable, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> 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 um, and um, really, if you look at those debates and you look at the concrete proposals coming from both sides, um, it was, it was, at the end of the day, really not going to be enough to actually sever ties with, uh, uh, with the Middle East. Um, I brought, actually, uh, the latest figures for um, who supplies the United States oil. As of 2008, Saudi Arabia was, December 2008, Saudi Arabia was number three. As of December 2009, <laughs> it was number four. The first three are Canada, Mexico, Nigeria, um, um, and, and so forth. So, in other words, 
Um, you know, despite all of this talk about t terrorism and fundamentalism and all the rest of it, fundamentally what unites these two countries together is this arrangement. And furthermore, the U.S. really relies on uh, Saudi Arabia, in addition to domestic consumption, to actually be a swing producer uh, on the world stage. That is to say, they will produce depending on what the U.S. wants to get out there to affect shape, uh, you know, the cost of uh, oil um, and so forth. Um, <coughs> you know, one of the theorists who uh, writes about it, you know, um, he had a subtitle in, in one of his chapters saying, no one swings like Saudi Arabia, <laughs> which if you know Saudi society is just such a weird thing to say, but um, uh, in the context of what we're saying, which is oil politics, that, that still uh, remains true. Um, and I'll come to a close with this. In addition to oil security, the U.S., of <coughs> course, continues to have deep economic ties with uh, Saudi Arabia. There are still very key political reasons as well why the U.S. maintains its relationship, including uh, the U.S. needs Saudi Arabia to be the quote-unquote moderate voice in the Arab-Israeli conflict um, and, and to do its dirty work and so forth. And so, uh, you know, here's how, uh, and this is why President Bush, of course, made, made a pilgrimage to Riyadh in 2008 to smooth things over. And President Obama, before he gave his historic speech in Cairo last year, went to Riyadh as well. And so uh, here's how Rachel Bronson puts it, an excellent book uh, that she has. She says, the relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia is, quote, thicker than oil, end quote. And I think that really captures it. And I think that relationship is going to continue to endure in the new millennium unless we see the kinds of strikes and struggles in the, of the 1950s and unless we see opposition in this country as well. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. So we have about half an hour for <laughs> discussion and comments. If people can raise their hands, I will call you. First speakers in the blue, second in the green, third in the black and white, and the fourth back there. Okay, I have, I have two questions. You just referred to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the recent uh, uh, events with the uh, condemnation of the uh, new settlements in East Jerusalem, and it was big, uh, a very vigorous uh, opposition, and then nothing happened. Uh, my question is, uh, is the U.S. relationship to Israel backing it so, you know, so vigorously uh, going <laughs> to jeopardize the hegemony the U.S. has in the Middle East regarding the Arab uh, client states? And could that actually lead to a shift in U.S. Uh, policies regarding Israeli-Palestinian conflict? That's my first question. The second is, uh, Nitzan and Bichler, Bichler uh, argued uh, in a <coughs> paper called The uh, Cheap Wars that the main driver for these uh, energy conflicts in the Middle East has been uh, the <coughs> oil companies and the almond companies wanting to get differential profits, re uh, a boost in their profits related to the uh, <coughs> Fortune 500, and they present evidence that in every case it seems to coincide. So I'd like your reactions, the whole panel, if possible. Okay. I'm going to take a whole bunch of questions and then throw yes. it back to the speakers. And if people want to bring up, uh, you know, if you want to answer questions uh, from the floor as well, please feel free to make a comment. Uh, go ahead. So thanks for the really wonderful um, talks. I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question about Afghanistan and, and oil, um, because I find very convincing the argument that Iraq especially and, and the, the goal of the war on terror in the end is control of the global oil spigot. You want to control the flow of oil internationally, and this is the key, the sort of end game, um, which has all sorts of geostrategic implications. But I find less convincing the argument that Afghanistan was about in any direct way, you know, some of the stuff that Pepe Escobar talks about, the pipeline politics, or even about sort of direct um, concerns about dominating Central Asia, uh, and I'm not saying these weren't concerns at all, or weren't motivating factors, but it seems much more to me that Afghanistan was a war fought to set up the war in Iraq and eventually in Iran, right? <laughs> For political reasons more than anything, if you were going to frame what you were doing 
as part of a war on terror and use 9-11. You had to go into Afghanistan first. And more than that, it was sort of the low-hanging fruit. And the idea was, well, you win a quick victory in Afghanistan, it'll be much easier then. That'll set up what'll be slightly harder battles. Maybe they didn't think they would be that much harder. But harder battles in Iraq, and then I think they, they did think it would be a real fight in Iran. And tied to that, it seems to me that right now, Frankly, they would like to get out of Afghanistan, except they don't think they can do it without incurring what is obviously a loss. And a loss, you know, the U.S. imperialism losing, it's open season on the U.S. all around the world. It just pushes <laughs> their credibility, right? And that makes Afghanistan a different situation uh, than Iraq or, you know. So, so I, I have a question about this is, uh, yeah. Okay. whether it be Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, because suppose you had a democratically elected leader of Saudi Arabia. That leader could t say, could subject us to blackmail, could say, look, if you don't enforce UN resolutions on Israel, then we're going to jack up the price of oil like three times. And would Americans really support democracy if it, in Saudi Arabia if it meant that they might have to pay higher prices in oil? And you know, there's a lot of talk about whether there's a clash of civilizations, you know, Islam versus the West. I think the issue is that we need oil for our economy, and we'll see on the world's oil, a lot of it. And so, um, you know, what about that threat of democracy in oil-rich countries? Mm -hmm. and, you know, like how would we deal with that? Yep. Yes. Uh, I'd like to say first that I enjoyed the presentations very much. I'm going to ask a question really of all of you. <laughs> uh, if you follow the capitalist press, like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times, uh, outside of these 12 basic areas like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, there is very little oil exploration out there other than very, very offshore platforms. And I was wondering, given that <coughs> circumstance, do you think the Hubbard curve in the next few years is going to drive prices up? I know it's speculation. I'd like you to comment on that. Yeah, you may have covered this, we were a few minutes late, but this morning's Times blog said that for the first time China has been has purchased more, more oil from, from Saudi Arabia than the United States. <coughs> last month or a month before. <coughs> so how, and that, uh, how quickly will China's presence uh, rival that of the United States and Saudi Arabia? Okay, any others before we turn it back to our speakers? Yeah. How do you project the situation in Iraq and Saudi Arabia in the next, let's say, two or, or, two or five years? What are your projections? <laughs> two or five years. Um, that What's your question? Given amount, um, like a time frame, but also, like, if you, when you analyze the, the oh. logic of, let's say, oil or resource control and, and exploitation, what is different now as opposed to the 70s? <coughs> How do we deliver this kind of information on a, on a larger scale? I mean, you know, this is an important element. So we hear this, you know, you read the books, we go to panels, we, we talk amongst ourselves. But how do we uh, deliver this kind of information into a, a mass media? Uh, I know that's a, not yeah. an easy question. It's what we always want to do. But it's something that we have to think about. Because when we're always talking to ourselves, uh, we only get so far. And, and, and there is a voting public that, that knows, you know, I don't have any faith in it. And it seems to not have the information that is needed. And this information about oil, it's always under sort of a subtext, <laughs> even amongst the mainstream media, uh, uh, or you know, but it, it's never delivered, mm -hmm. and, and and that's an issue. Go ahead. You talked about U.S. and Saudi interests, but you didn't make the distinction between uh, U.S. business interest and U.S. government interest, and you could throw some light on that. And also, the second topic is uh, war and what that does in <laughs> rigging prices. And if you could add that to your commentary, that would be nice. OK, I see a whole bunch of hands. Should I take them and then have a final yeah. wrap up? Yeah. Like, should we do that? OK. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> All right. OK, who wants to start? Most of the questions are about Saudi Arabia, so I'll pass this room. 
I just spoke, so somebody else should. I can just respond to the Afghanistan thing. I think the um, the issue of, of like oil, gas, Afghanistan is, of course, much more complicated um, because Afghanistan is not the issue in its own. It's the transit route, and so it is important in that context. And I think the reason why it's important to bring um, it into the conversation about energy security and oil is because it's completely absent. Um, in the mainstream, right? And even on the left, I mean, aside from Pepe Escobar, um, if you could consider him on the left, I suppose you could, um, there's really not a whole lot. And in fact, the, you know, the few things that one does manage to find out there um, talk specifically about how it has not been part of the mainstream conversation. And um, you know, we can speculate on why that is. Um, but I think it is important to draw it into the conversation because, of course, you know, um, I think in the case of Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, the U.S. really thought it was getting at least a two-for-one deal, right? Um, so setting up the, the um, invasion of Iraq, but also getting what they had not managed to get under the Taliban, which was, um, you know, a, a, a sort of um, reliable um, transit route for Central Asian gas, right? So I think there's, uh, nobody would really make the argument that it was just about, um, you know, gas or oil, but I do think it is important to sort of uh, put it in a broader context. Of course, now things are, you know, much more complicated, right? Because the U.S. cannot afford to stay and the U.S. cannot afford to get out, at least not very easily. So it is kind of a trap. And of course, now what you're starting to see filter into um, the, you know, sort of establishment media, such as the New York Times, is the call to have talks with the Taliban. So, you know, rewind back to, you know, 2001 or prior to 2001, right? And um, I mean, one of the ways in which to figure out uh, what might happen or definitely what the Pakistani establishment wants to happen is to read Ahmed Rashid, right? Mm -hmm. so he is the voice of the Pakistani establishment in the U.S. And he had um, an op-ed four, four days ago, I think, in the Washington Post that is all about why the U.S. must talk to the Taliban. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think you know these are things to sort of keep our, our um, focus on. Yeah. Let me <laughs> see if I can just pick up on that. Uh, I, I think that uh, so the answer to some, many of these questions comes from looking at this in a kind of broader brushstroke. I mean, back back when American foreign policy was very overt, uh, when the neocons were not in power, um, and they had to just sort of speak in public, we. we you know, and then they got into power and they did all the things they said they were going to do. <coughs> I mean, they used to talk about the arc of instability, mm -hmm. right, which was just another word for all the oil bearing, mm -hmm. oil exporting areas of the world, right. And of course it extended all the way over to Afghanistan, right, and all the way through the Horn of Africa, right. That was the arc of instability. It was not that unstable an area at the time. The U.S. <laughs> has managed to make it very unstable, <laughs> right. Um, but they used to refer to it as the arc of instability, and because it was so unstable, the United States had to X, Y, Z, right? And, and I think the key part of the X, Y, Z was then, was, the un and, and this was said by many people, including Barack Obama in his campaign speeches, we have to be the dominant power in that area. We have to be the dominant power in that area. That goes back to the sort of early 1990s rhetoric of the unipolar world, <laughs> in which the United States is the superpower and it's our responsibility to sort of impose on the world what will be the American century. After all, it was the project for the new American century. But, you know, adding uh, for the good of the world, right? Everybody's going to be better off once we pacify the world and get it all to be integrated into our economic hegemony, right? That, that's it. I don't think there's been any real alteration in that. And so Afghanistan is crucial for that from a geopolitical point of view, not so much from an oil point of view, but the arc of instability is crucial from an oil point of view. So they become the, you know, the corollary to the, to the oil rather than the oil. The pipeline, you know, obviously is, is, is in the forefront of their thinking a lot of the time, and obviously it's not so far in the forefront of their thinking at other times, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not as though oil is irrelevant, you know, because it's not just the oil bearing lands, it's also the oil transiting lands <laughs> that count. So I think, and, th and that's, that, that goes to the next, the next point, which is, would the US ever support democracy in any oil rich country? Well, if what your major policy is, 
is to be the dominant force over the oil exporting lands of the world. There's kind of a contradiction between that and saying that you're going to democracy today. <laughs> because the first thing that happens is that anyone gets, forget about democracy, a nationalist government. Right? Right. All yeah. they need is a nationalist government, and they're not going to be subject to all of these needs that the U.S. needs. And by the way, those needs are getting more and more desperate, right? I mean, just one piece that hasn't been mentioned today that we all had on our mind and somehow didn't mention is, is that any time there's a squeeze on oil, China's going to get it mm -hmm. because they can afford to pay more for it. The American economy is, is limp compared to the Chinese economy. It's a high profit economy. They have lots, they have huge profit margins and allow them to pay whatever <coughs> the price of oil is going to go up to. Mm -hmm. Whereas the American corporations are really in big trouble. So th in that sense, what they're trying to do is take the U.S.'s last superiority, which is military, and convert it into an economic superiority by saying, let's get control of the spigot, we'll, we'll decide how much is getting produced, and if push comes to shove and there's really a shortage, we'll get our client states to send us the oil instead of China on a favorable <laughs> deal, right? So there's that part too, right? So yeah, I think they, you know, any, any sign of independent activity by a government is a danger sign to the U.S. So obviously democracy is out of the question, even though they may even convince themselves they would be happy to have a democracy as long as the people were totally pro-American right. and always voted on the American interest rather than their own, you know. Okay, we like that kind of democracy or something like that. Um, one other thing, uh, I just wanted to sort of address the question of Iraq in five years. Um, I'm not sure Iraq's going to be much different in five years. It might just be a continuing location of struggle, right? I mean, there, you know, every, for everybody, the benchmark is the end of 2011 when the U.S. is supposed to pull the troops out. Everybody I know who follows that closely thinks that the United States, the Obama administration, is going to come up with a reason for keeping 50,000 American troops in that country in five <laughs> enduring bases, doubling the size of their embassy, which is already the largest in the history of the world, right? And the only competitor they have is the one they're building in Pakistan. Mm -hmm which should be a sign of <laughs> the interest the U.S. has in that area, right? And, and that they're going to continue to try to get the kind of control over Iraq and its <coughs> resources that will allow them to use <coughs> Iraq in the way that they projected from the beginning, which is Iraq is the client state. Now, if you go back to the 1970s and you think about Iran with the Shah in charge, that was like, you know, heaven on earth for the U.S. government, right? That was really beautiful. I, I think they're still looking for that. And they, the only place they have to get it is Iraq. Uh, you know, they've learned that they're not going to be able to get Iran back. And Saudi Arabia is just so unreliable and unstable also. Um, I think they're still looking at Iraq as the headquarters for the United States and Germany in the Middle East. And they're going to keep trying to get it. I think we've, as observers, right, kind of are convinced that they can't succeed. I know I don't, I don't think they can succeed in getting what they want. I keep waiting for them to change their, I, I keep get, waiting for them to change their strategy, but so far they haven't. So it may be that this stalemate will just go on. In about 10 minutes. So we're not going to come back. I don't think there's time to come back at the end. So. I think there's another part. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, sure. <laughs> well, I just... Are they waiting to come in already? I guess so. I'll just, I, totally I guess I'll just, I'll just throw in, a, I guess, a quick microphone. Um, microphone. Oh, I still have it. Just to follow up on what Michael just said about uh, China, because I think it's that's an important piece of this to... To add in, uh, foot, that he's that he's adding in about Just China's uh, economic dominance right now. Um, I and sorry, they. Uh, and I think that what's um, enabling them to the 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 drive for uh, energy sources for them is really um, uh, uh, stemming from the fact that their economy is growing and um, industrialization is increasing and so on. And so there's that's partly you know the the source of their uh, domestic energy needs. But what's happening now, uh, at least in particularly with Africa, is that this growing uh, economic strength is that they're they're being able to translate this into a growing military. Uh, um, 
you know, strength, strength as well. So what you're seeing now in terms of some of this, the intensification um, of, of, of and militarization I spoke about earlier is that you're seeing for the first time in history Chinese warships out of their immediate um, um, sort of military theater. So there's Chinese warships, uh, for example, supposedly patrolling a, a against uh, uh, Somali pirates in the, uh, you know, the Horn of Africa area and then also off the West Coast and so on, which I think is sort of, you know, indicative of, uh, of a growing uh, you know, kind of intensification, and and the U.S. is, you know, as Michael said, it's still the dominant military power, and it's will, it's not, it's not going to let China just, you know, kind of walk away with this without uh, a fight, and and this is, you know, plays out in any number of levels, and one of which is that uh, they they're particularly trying to, uh, you know, match it in terms of the sort of military expenditures that I talked about, and this is, I think, for those of us who are, you know, social justice activists and so on, we should be very concerned about this, about the very real threat of military intervention, um, possibly in, you know, a place like Nigeria or in the Horn of Africa. They've done war game scenarios in Nigeria and so on with, you know, looking out for this, um, this type of thing. But I think that, um, just to say also very quickly about the change from the 1970s and probably other people in the audience or up here could maybe speak to this more generally. I mean, in recent years, because of this sort of growing crisis around uh, sources of oil, is that there's been um, new investments in oil exploration from, you know, from a, a wider field of players. You know, I'd mentioned Brazil, for example. Brazil has um, been one of the areas where they've discovered some of these very, um, they've invested a lot in deep water water technology. There's been some very, very important um wells discovered in in off the coast of Brazil um, and so on and I think that this is where you're you know it's it's just generally adding you know to the picture of of, of, of a more um, of a more crowded field uh, and 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 the um, you know as Michael said you know Iraq no in terms of the quantity that's possible in Iraq you know far and away but I think we're you know we're starting to see you know growing uh, uh, you know sort of uh, uh, you know sources and 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 so on, and I think that this is that's where they have to go. It's a tight, it's a it's a it's a more conflict-ridden, tightening field. And so one place they can push outwards is investment in technology to try to get around what are inherently political problems and political problems, sort of at the with at the with this that are rooted in a fundamental contradiction at the heart of capitalism, which is sort of this drive for a conflict over resources <coughs> in a very integrated world system. I mean, you know, you press down in one place and the problems pop up in another and, and that's really, you know, what we're, uh, you know, what we're looking at, uh, what we're looking at here. So um, I'll just stop so I guess we'll have time for more. I don't, I don't know what Actually, no, I'm going to have to just take up one or two of these questions and then the next panel is outside, so we're going to have to call it quits. Um, just on the question of democracy and whether the U.S. can tolerate democracies in oil-rich countries, you know, Michael started to address it. I'll just say something in the context of Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, one of the things that people, uh, first of all, very little is known about Saudi Arabia, right? And what is known is typically cliched, orientalist, and, uh, you know, there's this image of this country that's just all desert, there's no development and so on. Actually, it's just one-third desert and Mecca and Medina have always been centers of urban development and so on and so forth. So first of all, there's very little that's known. But if there's very little that's known about Saudi Arabia, there's, there's even less that's known about the social movements that happened there, the fact that there were labor strikes, the fact that uh, you know, there were nationalists and so on who wanted to see a different kind of country back in the 50s and 60s and so forth. And um, of course, the U.S. would not tolerate that. And Aramco actually be, is one of the intermediaries to uh, try to squash this. So Aramco would give the names of labor organizers to the Saudi government and the Saudi government would then torture and or execute them. And so the U.S. has had no interest whatsoever. Similarly with the free princes, when the U.S. got wind of you know, what they're trying to do and so forth, they were squashed, they were brought into line, etc. So of course it's all about oil and democracy gets in the way of control over oil. Um, in terms of the relationship between uh, U.S. business interests in Saudi Arabia versus uh, U.S. government interests, again very quickly Robert Vitalis's book, it's called America's Kingdom, really talks about
about the strategy that the U.S. used in Saudi Arabia, which is a corporate imperialism um, at the time. That is, they didn't really, other than the base in Dahran, which comes into being in the 1940s, the U.S. has relied on Aramco and this kind of imperialism. And Aramco really was a government within a government. Um, they ran everything, the airports, the roads, um, and, you know, water systems and so on and so forth. And that was a way of sort of maintaining control until Saudi Arabia gets, uh, uh, Aramco gets nationalized fully in the 1980s. Uh, lastly, on uh, China and the U.S. and their rivalry, I just want to add to what's already been said, and that is that while on the one hand they are rivals, of course, on the other there is also a, an interdependent relationship. China, uh, you know, um, is the biggest debtor to the United States, and, um, you know, the U.S. needs that, and the U.S., of course, uh, is one of the big markets for Chinese goods. But in terms of Saudi Arabia, it may be true that Saudi Arabia is exporting largely to China. China is the biggest uh, uh, exporter and uh, importer and so forth. But China still doesn't have the advantage that the U.S. has, which is that Saudi Arabia needs military equipment from the U.S. And that's been, you know, the, I, I've, I've mentioned oil, but it's oil for security. And that security is both to squash domestic dissent and to fend off against regional rivals. In 91, it was Iraq. Uh, now, uh, and since 79, uh, it's been Iran and so on. So that advantage, uh, uh, the United States still continues to have. And finally, on the question of how do we get this out to larger audiences? Well, Joe is taping this, <laughs> and we hope it's going to be on YouTube. Um, I think people should have more panels, but we need to rebuild the anti-war movement, because that's how people really, a whole generation, 